Welcome to this version of Belmont Journal here at Belmont uh, Media Center. I'm Steve Rosales, your, your host today. It is Thursday, August 17th, 2023. And with me today, we have the pleasure of having our new superintendent, Dr. Jill Geyser, accompanied by the current chair of our own school committee, Meg Moriarty. Dr. Geyser, Meg, welcome again. Thank you. Thank nice you. to have you here. Good to be here. It's the first time I've met you, doctor. Yes. So uh, do you go by doctor, or how is it? You can call me Jill. I can call you Jill? Yes. All right. I'm Thank just you. Steve. That's okay. <laughs> I appreciate that. Well, so, okay. It is August. School starts in three weeks. Uh, you started a little bit earlier this summer, but I'm sure you're, you're busy as can be. Yes, definitely. All right. So I'm just meeting you, but you do live here in Belmont. Yes. And you've been here for, well, a few years, correct? Correct. Since 2008. Okay. Well, and uh, did you grow up around here? No, actually. Um, I'm, I was originally born in Wisconsin, uh, so originally from the Midwest. When I was a kid around 10 years old, we moved to Maryland. So most of my elementary, middle, and high school were, done, were in Maryland. Um, I went to University of Delaware for my undergrad. And pretty much after that, I moved it to different places. I lived overseas. I lived in different states in the US. Um, and then we, my husband and I landed here in Massachusetts in 2005, spent a few years in Central Square before moving to Belmont in 2008. Well, welcome. That's the well, short version. That's of the <laughs> short version. That's the short version. Well, you know, I, I see you here, and uh, so you, you're settled here in Belmont. Uh, you have a nice uh, introduction here. I mean, it, it begs the question. So you're now the superintendent, but you've served as an elementary principal. Yes. You served as a middle school principal. You've served as an assistant superintendent in your career. So you've been hardened by the by the kids in middle, <laughs> which, was, which was more interesting, which was more difficult, elementary or middle school? Well, I, was, I also started as an assistant principal in a high school. Okay, so, so you've, sort of, you've yeah, sort of had the triple, the levels, you, yes. you've, you've done you've hit the triple play there. Yeah, different, yeah. different level. Different and here you are now at the trouble. top of the heap, yep. and, and I see you are incredibly well educated, uh, BA, two masters, a PhD from my alma mater, Boston College, so that's near and dear to myself. Uh, but more interesting, and it begs a quick story, I would think, is that you taught uh, English uh, language education in places such as Woodbridge, Virginia, Bangkok, Thailand, Page, Arizona, Cambridge, Massachusetts, and most interestingly, Kathmandu, Nepal. Yes. So it begs the question, what brought you to Kathmandu, other than Bob oh. Seger's song? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, so I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Nepal uh, right after college. And it was basically that, like I wanted to, um, I, at, up until that point, I did, really didn't do much of any traveling outside the US. So I knew I wanted to um, experience different places. And so that's what uh, got me interested in doing Peace Corps. And then it was actually while I was teaching in Nepal that I fell in love with teaching and learning. And so that got me on that education track. So. Uh, the, or the original interest was really about experiencing other cultures and other places in the world and, of course, as a volunteer, uh, giving back and contributing uh, to society. But also, but then it was the, t the actual experience of teaching that got me on that um, education path. So, so Kathmandu, did yeah. you, did you... Uh, trek? Yeah, did um, you trek? A little bit, yeah. <laughs> so my, my first year I was in what was called, the region was called Terai, which is in the southern part of the country. It's flat, um, dry, and, and hot. Um, and then the hills, I, in my second year, I lived in what was called the hills, which here would probably be more like mountains because they were very large. Um, and so that, that's where I spent my second year and did, yeah, like we, I did trekking a little bit here and there. This, we did, I did teacher trainings my second year. So there were a couple of opportunities where I had to um, walk out to other volunteers' posts to collaborate with them on some trainings that we were delivering. Fascinating. We'll have a cup of coffee someday and you can tell me. Love to. Bangkok, I'm sure, <laughs> is probably another story, so yes. I'm sure they're all there. Yes. So, okay, so you've been all those things uh, prior to becoming here to Belmont. Uh, so you've started. So how do you prepare for coming into sort of a new spot? You, it's not like you rose yes. through the ranks of Belmont. So this is a whole new, I think, uh, exposure, I would think. So. I think you used the, the word entry process. Yes. That's very technical, so I might as well use that. What, what was your entry process or your entry planning, planning yes. methodology? Yes. 
Yeah, no, I, I appreciate the question. Um, so basically, what happens is as soon as I was um, hired, I spent May and June starting to meet with people. So that was part of the, that was the beginning stages of it. Uh, I met with school committee members, I met with uh, some of the leadership, the principals, and so forth. And then um, through that, as, and this was the, the sort of inception of the entry planning process, the plan itself is really just that. Who am I talking to? Who are the community leaders, the town leaders, department leaders, um, the staff members, the teachers, um, professional aides, custodians, all the staff in the school, and uh, making sure that, I, that I'm getting out to as many people as I possibly can that will help me learn about the community and to learn what the priorities are here for, for Belmont. And so that's part of it. The other part I'm looking at are various documents, whether they're contracts or um, any other kinds of documents that I need to look at, uh, manuals and so forth, policies certainly. And then uh, also looking at some data points, uh, whether it's uh, achievement data, learning data, or um, like the YRBS data and so forth. So all of that will be going into my plan, which I'm going to present to the school committee at the beginning of September. That will take a few months. Uh, and then around mid-year, I'll be presenting initial findings of that plan, that will, which will then launch us into a strategic planning process. Um, when I came in, so Derry, kind of going back to the application process, because you, you sort of mentioned how it was coming in from the outside, not coming through the ranks. Um, my, my stepping into this role was not something that came lightly for me. Um, I, I had been a, an assistant superintendent for a few years before I actually started to say, okay, I, I want to do this. I want to do the work of being a superintendent, mm -hmm. right? And so, um, but at the same time, while I was coming to that, I was also thinking that I couldn't just do that work anywhere. It's, 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 a, it's a big job, right? And it, there's, there's so much that goes into it. Sure, bigger than what people even realize. Yeah, and, so. it's, and it's like, if I'm gonna, you, you put so much into it. So in order for me to do that, I needed it to be in a place where I felt connected to, where I, feel, I felt like I understood and where the values, um, where I felt like the values really aligned. And so that's why when Belmont, when I saw that Belmont was opening up, I basically was like, I want to do this work in Belmont. It's like, it's the place where I feel like I can gel with and, and I understand the challenges. I understand uh, the successes and the strengths of the community. At the same time as I come in as a resident, because I'm a resident here, so I, I had an idea of what, you know, sort of what the community was about that's where my entry planning is really helping then to kind of fill in some details like what are the different perspectives that people have in terms of what's important for our schools well jill so you mentioned that you're from belmont so do you find it to be a a, a benefit that you're now the superintendent of the community that you live or do you have any trepidations i mean pros and cons good or bad uh, i don't know no, that's a great question, and I will say that I even when I was applying, I actually I checked in with my husband about this because it would be, you know, if we're out in the community and and you know that that could impact all of the family, not just me, right? So coming into it, the, it's I I saw it as just more more of an advantage at this point around being a resident because of that piece of where I I know the community, I understand the culture around it. Um, the other part about it that was really compelling for me is now it's I'm more able to get out to some of the events around the school where I was when I was working in where in Bill Ricker where I, I had to travel a little bit further it was more challenging for me to be able to be at certain events around the district more often so that's where I, I feel like here it's a little bit it'll be a little bit easier for me to do that if I you know even if it's popping by a game some at some point you know even if it's for part of the time like those kinds of things that's what I am looking forward to being able to do more easily um, so that that part is beneficial whether there's you know if anything comes up that may pose more challenges around that I I'll Feel that when it comes, you know. That's it's, perfect, you know. Yeah. You just take, take, take it one take day what at a time. Give. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> you know, take the cards you dealt at yes. certain hands. Yes. Uh, well, okay. So you mentioned before I go to, to Meg, we, we have Meg down there, but I, I've got 
<laughs> hot news for Meg here. She's going to give us some hot scoops in a second. But let me close the loop. You mentioned when you were coming in, you were reviewing staff, principals. Yes. That we seem to be losing some principals yes. and losing some staff. Yes. So uh, I don't necessarily need to go there. Everybody has their own reason. But what are you doing to sort of good question to, to fill those yes. needed positions? Yes. So um, when we are for our principal positions that are these um, late later departures. We are hiring interim principals because we don't have time for a full process. And full process means um, the initial interview and then a public part where usually it's a forum with the community mm -hmm. um, and then making the final decision with, around the finalists. <coughs> because we don't have time, we are not a, in a position to hire a permanent principal with, with that process not in place. So we, we are hiring interims with the idea that we will be running full searches um, probably starting late fall, early winter, this coming school year. So we actually have now five interim positions that we'll need to do hiring processes for this coming year. Um, so the one part about that that I keep thinking about is, and even with these interims, we reach out to our professional networks to, uh, to try to recruit people to, to apply for those positions. And um, the other, but the other part about this, this idea of retaining staff that I find, um, that I've been thinking a lot about, it has to do with building a team, your team of people within the system. So for example, for our principals, we need to make sure that we're building the team of principals, strengthening that collaboration relationships with each other so that um, they, so that that helps with, basically helps them to feel like they belong to something and is more likely to, to um, retain those those people that are in those positions. That's not just principals, though. That's also the larger leadership team, including our directors, our curriculum coordinators, our assistant principals. So that team connection is going to be important in creating those conditions that will will kind of encourage people to stay with us. Um, that's something I'll be looking looking towards as we move forward. Is that retention of our leadership in the district? That's going to be very important for us. Well, we, we look forward to seeing that. I'm sure Thank that uh, process will go forward. Yes. And uh, you know, you'll make some good decisions. And good luck to you and good luck to the interims and everybody else going forward. Thank you. Um, okay. So we have with us uh, the chair of our school committee also, Meg Moriarty. Uh, Meg, it's now the uh, 17th of August. When school starts, what, three weeks? A little less than three weeks, actually. Oh, uh, are we ready? Absolutely. <laughs> Good answer. Absolutely. Even if you're not, absolutely we're ready. <laughs> the energy is there. So uh, this is hot news. So I think yesterday, was it yesterday morning or was it the day before yesterday? Yesterday that, morning. That yep. uh, the, I think there was a ceremony in the morning or a meeting where the Belmont High School, Middle School, Building Committee, whatever the name is, officially turned over that building to the school committee and to the town of Belmont. That's, That's correct. Right. That is That's correct. That's a big day. It is. It means that the building is ready to be occupied by our educators, um, administrators, and students. So, um, on so they both can sides, start moving the, in. The high school part, what I'll call the high school right. portion, that wing has been open for a year. But yep. the what I'll call the middle school, is that what it's going to be called? The middle school wing yeah. is it, now it's, Belmont middle it's school. ready to go. Yeah, yeah. It is ready. And how many kids going in, ballpark? Uh, the, so we're at about. 14-ish, 100 in the, in the high school, and somewhere around six or seven, I think, somewhere well, around that. In, I get yeah, it. You know, you can be off school. a few steps. Yeah. All right. You're yeah. new. It's okay. So about 2,100, We were just, we were just talking about this. That's students. why I was like, oh, I'm not looking for an exact yeah. number. But, this <laughs> one, I get, but it's, a, it's the largest number. I mean, yeah. I went to school uh, there uh, in, the, in the new school, which is now the Rip Down School, but it, I graduated the class of 350. So they were probably about the same. So it was probably seven, probably fourteen hundred in the four yeah. grades at on at Concord Ave at the campus. Yes. Now it's what twenty one hundred yeah. ballpark two thousand twenty two hundred. That's that's a larger influx of students. Yes. Yes. Um, good luck trying to corral that. I would think <laughs> like herding cats. But what's the significance, uh, Meg? What's uh, tell us about? The new school. Tell us what, what's going on. Yeah, absolutely. So um, first of all, to your point about corralling them, one of the <laughs> nice things about the new school Maybe is... Maybe it's a poor choice of words, <laughs> but, but it's but what each, came to mind. You know, in the middle school, each um, grade has its own floor, 
And then on those floors, uh, our middle schoolers will still be in teams. And is, so that is it will seven be and same. eight on that wing, or is it seven, seven and eight, eight yeah. and nine? So seven and eight. Seven so, and eight. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Go ahead. And I'm so sorry. the the evening before the meeting yesterday, where the building was turned over to the school committee, um, Bill Avalo, chair of the the building committee, uh, gave a tour for the school committee, and there were just. Some of the spaces that really stood out to me in terms of how are we supporting, you know, all of our students and all of our educators. So uh, the collaboration spaces. So each of these teams, um, you know, has spaces outside of their rooms where students can work together um, or spend some time working by themselves by a window um, for a little while and then coming back together. Um, you know, in collaborating. Um, there were rooms where the walls can move so that teachers can be collaborating with their, with their different classes. And so I think that collaboration was really something that stood out to me. Another piece of the building that I know the community has um, been very interested in is our space for our lab students. And I walked into one of those rooms, and it was a room for building uh, life skills uh, with our lab students. And you know, there were washers and dryers. There's a kitchen. There's and everything is new. And the you know, there's enough space uh, to welcome even more students there. Uh, and there were very professional spaces. So I know that uh, we have a high school intern here today, which is awesome to see. And the professional spaces of our performing arts. And our music is uh, definitely a sight to see. There are professional dressing rooms now for the theater students. Uh, all of the gyms and the pool and the weight room has had a facelift. So all those, although those spaces are not brand new in terms of the building, um, for those of you who are familiar with the gym, it used to be very dark wood. And now it's all bright. It's all new lights. I also got onto the roof to see all those solar panels up there. Um, and learned a lot about you know, the heating and cooling system that will be more efficient. I had heard that we have these heated sidewalks and people thought those were really fancy, but in fact, that um, is not a fancy addition to the building. It's actually how we will help cool the building in an efficient way. So it's actually like we're getting rid of the heat through um, the outside of the building, through the sidewalks and what have you. So um, it just, it, it was just really amazing to see this, this building that was truly like when we went into the room uh, with all the mechanicals, it's, you know, it's living and breathing um, and, and efficient. And I just can't wait to see our students and our staff get in there um, and bring more life to it. So, well, you described something that's pretty spectacular sounding. And uh, so seventh and eighth, a floor each, before we go to the high school push, but the, yep. that's, this is the new one. They're coming down from the Chenry. So is this going to be a whole new sort of learning environment, not just physically, but uh, but substantively, you talk about collaboration. I it's been a long time since I've been out of the Chenry or the middle school yep. or my kids have been out. So a lot of advancements and changes, but is there going to be a sort of be a change in the whole methodology given the new space? So I think over time, certainly from the time that I was in school, you know, the way teaching and learning happens has changed dramatically and that this space now is in keeping in line with where the trends are going based on, you know, the research and also just how the world works. You have to be able to get out there and interact with all different types of people, um, different types of people from different cultures um, and problem solve. And you know that's done in collaboration as well as sometimes individually. So I'm excited to see how our teachers will begin to use that space. Um, I can imagine that they'll also need their own collaboration time and time to think about how they're gonna use that space uh, to benefit all of our students. Okay, and, and the high school, any big changes in what I'll call the high school chunk? You've so, sort of had a year worth, not without you, not without you, Jill, you, you mm -hmm. but is, they've been occupied. Yeah, I mean, I and, think they have very similar spaces, but I'm excited to see some of the synergy. Just on my way here, I got an email actually from, you know, the field hockey where now eighth graders are being invited to try out for ninth grade field hockey. So I'm, I'm excited to see how some of the synergy of the high school and middle school being together I can imagine it might take educators a little bit of time to figure out how that's going to work, but you know how can how can they take advantage of students being together in the different ages, um, and also teachers being able to see, oh, this is what the seventh and eighth grade curriculum looks like. So how can I build on that in ninth grade? And now they're in the same building, um, and so I think that it will allow for a little bit more of of that you know that synergy. So well, okay, I was under the impression that they would be. 
Is that, well, the synergy, is that probably for more after school type things? I was under the impression, perhaps erroneously, that there was going to be uh, a separation between the seventh and eighth grades from the rest of the high, the older, what I'll call the older kids, the high school kids. Yeah, um, no, I mean, the lunchroom is not, shared. Is that, is that not going to be happening? Um, I think that the term that um, had been used were careful, do you know? Yeah, uh, careful separation. Oh, careful um, connections and something separations. I forget what the right. So I think, was. Yes. I mean, I, I think that um, thoughtful, it, thoughtful separation. separation. Yeah, so, uh, so the buildings are, are, there's no, you know, real wall bet between the two yeah. of them. I mean, they share a cafeteria and yet they each have separate wings. They have separate libraries. Um, the middle schoolers will travel to the music side, which is on the high school side. So there'll be some crossing, but I think more of what I um, was talking about was the opportunity to kind of build uh, curricular crossover. Um, and so certainly that happens during the school day, whether that actually means students of different grades getting together or whether I, I, what I'm thinking more of is in terms of educators being able to think about how the curriculum serves students um, across our seven and 12 uh, curricular you know, structure. Okay. Well, thank you. So, all right, this I can, I'll throw this, this, this general question to both of you. So, okay, so seven and eight come out of the Chenry, leaving the sixth or the fifth and sixth. What happens to the rest of the grades? <laughs> How about that? Where does everybody else go? <laughs> I can speak to that a little bit. So, um, yeah, no, that's a good question. So right now, next year, um, the Chenry Upper Elementary School, we call it the Q, um, will have fifth and sixth grade there. And then um, next year in fall 2024, grade four will come oh, so up. So four is not going up this year. Right. Next year for four. Four will come up. So this year will be the planning year for that. Um, and the planning year will involve um, sort of obviously our schedule. What will that look like? The, uh, the, the planning will also be around how do we design a space for upper elementary. So chenry has been a five through eight, like clearly a middle school. So we need to rethink the space and what the day looks like to make sure that it is tailored to the upper elementary grades. So that's will, that will be the work that we'll do for this, this year. year. Yeah. For this year. Yeah. Okay. Well, they should have a lot of space up there. You're losing a whole yes. grade, unless they were that overcrowded. I don't know. It hasn't been a while. It was pretty packed when, I think it got up to, at one point, like 15, 1,600 students at the Chenery, which was, and I think it was a building built for like 1,000 students, maybe, um, something like that. So it got, it was pretty packed. <laughs> well, the ebb yeah. and flow. As I said, yes. I graduated about 350, yet my daughter's graduated 200, one graduated 180. Yeah. So it's, I guess it it's, uh, it it's uh, up and ebb down. and a flow is what yes. I'll call, and we'll see how it works. But, yes. well, thank you. That's very exciting. When's the official day of schools? When's it start? The 6th. The 6th? Yeah. Is it the Wednesday after Labor Day? Yes. Wednesday Teachers come back on the 5th. Wednesday after Labor Day. <laughs> well, at least it's not before Labor Day. That used to, <laughs> some people are back already. All right. So, okay. We got, uh, all right. We got a few here. So, uh, Okay, and uh, okay, we'll, we'll just broach this quickly. So, budget, it's always a big thing. I'm sure you got to observe the <laughs> scintillating budget debate at town meeting that we had yes. and how it all worked out. Yes. Um, so, there's always interest in, in allocation mm -hmm. of what's what. Um, so, you've suggested, you know, how do you, pro how do you, what's your approach to that? I mean, do you have any, to meet the needs of students? Do you have any general philosophy as to where you want to put more or less funds? That's a great question. So what I, that's what I'm asking now, some of my questions around the, the budget process, of course. Um, so what I need to be looking at or will be looking at is where the, um, what is allocated where, um, particularly with staffing, but then also certainly with other things like curriculum and materials. Um, there's also the question of like, are we, are we focusing our, our budget sort of ads or if we have to increase anywhere um, on staff or curriculum or both? So one of the areas that I'll be looking at are, um, especially around literacy and math, what curriculum that we're using. So there may be some opportunity there to purchase other kinds of curriculum that maybe have come out a little more recently. I don't know yet, so that's something I need to look at. So some of the budget will be about staffing, but also some of it will be what other resources will we need to, to be able to 
make sure that our kids are getting the learning experiences that they need. With the one thing with budget, um, and this is something I've learned over the years, is that there's there's never a lack of need for anything, right? And so the decisions are about prioritizing and using really good data to tell you what needs the prior what needs to be prioritized. Um, the one piece that I've learned though over the years is this idea that, and I'm going to steal words from um, someone I worked with before. Um, think of budget as a not a uh, competition to be won, but a problem to be solved. So we are all vying for the same resources. My approach is to um, be as collaborative as I can around making sure that things that need to be taken care of are taken care of. Um, this is going to be a challenging budget year because you know we're looking for the we're looking for the the funds needed to support the resources that that we need from the town. And so for me, it's about investing in the um, education of our kids, and that's really going to be a big message for us. Um, we have to, I think, um, make sure that, and I think the, as we talked about the building that, um, and what Meg was saying about the, how we could, how that space allows for a lot of opportunity around changing what our, the learning experiences look like for our kids. Um, that is a, that's, that is something that we are thinking differently about learning for our kids that maybe did not occur 20, 30 years ago. So we're looking at what do we need to put in place now to serve our kids who are living in a world now for a future that we're trying to anticipate what they need to be prepared for. So that's part of our thinking around budget. Like when we're thinking about what resources that we need, what curriculum we need, what staffing we need, it is about preparing our kids for the future. So that that's that's a very like large picture budget piece, but it definitely impacts how we're looking at the budget and how we're allocating our okay, resources. Well, good luck with that. Yeah, it seems thanks. to be you know, a, pie, a pie has a certain size of the pie, and it's yes. a question of, I suppose, how you slice yes. the pie and who gets the Absolutely. larger piece. There's a lot that goes into that, but uh, I, yes. I agree with you. It literally is a pie chart, it is. I, I would think. So, yes. uh, but I'll leave it to you and the, <laughs> the, the school committee and all the others, your rest of your staff, to figure that out. I'm a yes. taxpayer, and you know, I, 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 we'll see what happens. Yes. You, you got some money this year, yeah. and I'm sure you'll spend it uh, to the best of your ability and yeah. with the greatest of prudence. So we're looking forward to that. Good luck Thank with you. that. We've got like a minute and a half. So here's a, how about a fun question. Uh, what do you do for fun? I'm sure this isn't all you do for fun. You got any hobbies? You got any special talents? Other than trekking Nepal. Uh, trekking in Nepal, and, uh, yes. everything else. <laughs> Um, well, it's interesting because I, I haven't been doing a lot of this, but when I was younger, I did, we, I did do a lot of hiking. Um, so I would say, I, I mean, on the day-to-day, -day, I mean, just general stuff like going out, taking our dog out to, to the park. You we, dog? We what kind of dog? A uh, lab mix. Lab mix. Yeah. What's the dog's name? I got yelled at for not asking, I guess, the, the, lab, <laughs> the dog's name. Keenan. Keenan. And if anybody ever sees a yellow lab mix dog named Keenan out at Grove Street Park, that's probably ours. <laughs> okay. And it's very, he's very loud. Return so. to sender. <laughs> yes. to return yes. to sender. Okay. <laughs> Um, and then, uh, obviously, reading and, and spending time with family, certainly. Um, the, the part, though, what I really love to do is I love to travel. So um, whenever we can, we try to um, especially go overseas and do trips like that, um, just to, you know, like, a, like kind of the same reason why I went to Nepal in the first place is to experience other places, other cultures, um, and eat other kinds of food. That's, that's also what we do is we like to eat. Good food. <laughs> foodie. Okay. Well, there you go. Well, that's, all right. I'm sure you had yes. some experiences in Thailand and maybe Catman yes. do to experiment some interesting things. Yes. More so than uh, Wisconsin. Yes. That so a true. lot of cheese in Wisconsin. <laughs> yes. Well, I had cheese curds. They were, they were pretty cheese darn good. Cheese curds are they're, good. They're not healthy for <laughs> yeah. you, but they're really they're good. They're really good. Mm. Anyway, yes. I think we'll end on, on that note. It's a good note. Cheese curds Thank and uh, Wisconsin. <laughs> so, uh, well, the time has flown by. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank you, Dr. Jill Geiser, Meg Moriarty, chair lady of the uh, Belmont School Committee, chairperson of the school committee, chair sure. of the school committee. I'll just chair. leave it at that. Uh, <laughs> thanks for your time. It's early in the year. I look forward. Hopefully you'll come back. I, I don't will. bite. Love to. And we'll, we'll see how it goes. Good yeah. luck to you both. Thanks thank for coming you. on the show. I'm Steve Rosales. We've just finished another Belmont Journal. Thanks to the great Cracker Jack staff and everybody in the room and our producer, Joanne Zublis. Uh, until next time, take care.